Newton welcoming you to the Don Lane Show, seen right throughout Australia on the National Nine Network and affiliate stations. Tonight, Don's special guest will be via satellite from Hollywood, Miss Angie Dickinson. And now, here's Don. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a lovely greeting. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Okay. Welcome to the Don Lane Show. Let's take a quick look at the news around the country, okay? Here in Richmond, a local travel agent got the sack when he tried to convince Siamese twins to take separate holidays. <laughs> in Tas... <laughs> Leave him alone. I'm letting him work on him. In, in Tasmania, police have arrested a horticultural expert who let his garden go to pot. <laughs> And in Perth, a man saw a Keep Australia Beautiful ad and went out and shot his mother-in-law. <laughs> I like that one. That was good. Had a good time. I went to the doctor for a checkup yesterday. You know how when you're in a doctor's office, you can hear things going on in the other room? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, tell, I felt sorry for whoever was in there, you know, because I, I heard the doctor say, first, the good news, you're going to have a disease named after you. <laughs> We argued about that one for a while. <laughs> was true. Oh, I must mention the fact tonight that uh, one of our crew members has just been named Father of the Year by 12 different girls. <laughs> I just thought of something. What's that? Two more and it catches up to you. I... <laughs> Don, you I Go must, if, if you don't mind interrupt, I, I must say just how much I'm looking forward to the singing dog tonight. Oh, that Molly the singing oh, dog. Yes. That's right. You know she's even made a record. Did you know that? Oh well, if you you've heard naturally of my uncle's singing chicken, haven't you? <laughs> you you what? My uncle. You've heard of Foul Face Newton and Charlie the Singing Chook? <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of Foul Face Newton and Charlie. The, that's how no, I got in the show business. Charlie the Singing Chook. Oh yes, he made a gold record well, about three or four years ago now. Don't you remember him? Eat your heart out, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> You might recall the hit single, I Left My Giblets in San Francisco. Yeah, it's a very, very big hit. Yes, I very understand. You may, well, did it do anything else uh, besides singing? Uh... Charlie, the singing, oh, it didn't only sing. It, 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 it juggled, it, it told jokes, it did mimes, it did everything. Magnificent performer. Well, how come you never had it come on the show? Well, a um, bit hard. Why? Uh, Uncle Charlie hit bad times and ate the act. <laughs> Sad. Sad. You want to know the real reason why I couldn't have done? The act didn't have a finish. It runs in the family. <laughs> <laughs> Neither did this gag, right? <laughs> okay, the really exciting news tonight by Sally. This is a beautiful lady from Hollywood. One of the most... Uh, we're going to talk to her by satellite from Hollywood. One of the most beautiful and talented uh, and uh, film and television stars ever to grace the screen. Angie Dickinson will be talking about. And also, also uh, you're going to meet tonight, you know, I, I had the pleasure of, uh, of talking to this guy this afternoon. And boy, he is just, uh, he's wonderful. He really is. I am so impressed with him. A, uh, a bona fide A number one Australian world champion. In fact, Grand Prix champion uh, for 1980. Alan Jones will be here. <laughs> great one here. And, uh, We'll also meet the Devney Park High School Band, and to open the show, they've got a whole thing back there. This looks like something out of... What was that program on, on ABC they used to run about the Fort, Fort Apache and... Uh, um, oh, uh, uh, F Troop. This yeah. day tonight, no? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Same battle. We got our own F Troop practically back there. Ray Burgess is there, the ballet is there, the song is called Life at the Outpost. Put them together and we're off. Here we go. Andrew
much and welcome back. Uh, Angie Dickinson would have to be television's best known and sexiest police sergeant. Uh, as Pepper Anderson and policewoman, she commanded the respect of her peers for her acting ability, but she also uh, championed by her strong and convincing attitude the cause of equality that the uh, women of the time were first searching for. Uh, she made her first real film impact when she starred opposite the legendary John Wayne in Rio Bravo. And her list of leading men would make most women's mouths water. But that's nothing compared to what she has done for the male population over the years. At 49, she's been acclaimed as the sex symbol of the 80s, a title few would argue. Uh, and she has returned to motion pictures in a suspense thriller that has the hottest box office sales in the business. It's called Dressed to Kill. And it's been compared favorably with any of Hitchcock's best. It also includes a few well-talked-about and steamy scenes. She plays Kate Miller, a frustrated suburban housewife who finds herself involved with a psychotic killer. And in this scene with her psychiatrist, Michael Caine, it could be said in true Godfather style, she makes him an offer he can't refuse. Have a look. How are things going with Mike? Fine. Good. No, they're not fine. What a dumb word that is. Maybe there's something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. Do you find me attractive? Of course. Would you want to sleep with me? Yes. Then why don't you? <laughs> I never... 
I never get offers like that. Ladies and gentlemen, by satellite from Hollywood, would you say hello to Angie Dickinson? Here, we got it. Beautiful as well. Look at that. <laughs> How are you, Angie? I'm pretty good. Yes. Thank you. Do you get uptight or nervous over these kind of interviews? Uh... No, I'm just thinking about that wonderful line on the clip you just showed the audience. <laughs> That's uh, one of the reasons I took that picture. I just love that answer. <laughs> I read uh, that you looked at the script and laughed a lot, even though it is a, a suspense thriller and all of that. You looked at the script and laughed a lot and said there's a lot in there that you didn't believe could be done. Is that right? Yes, I did. I mean, I laughed w with astonishment that uh, anybody, much less me, could be doing this. Uh, the taxi scene <laughs> that you uh, allude to. Yeah. And I said, Brian, you're kidding. <laughs> you, yeah. You've got to be joking. He said, no, 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 but it'll be good taste. Yeah. We'll, so we'll, I took a chance. We'll talk about the taxi scene in a minute, and we'll also show him a clip of what we're talking about. But uh, tell me about the storyline of this motion picture. Uh, what is this basically about? Well, I'm a, a housewife, and I just go through my usual chores of the day getting ready to go into the city, into uh, New York City. I live in the suburbs, and I'm rather discontented with my husband's lovemaking mm. at this point in my life. And uh, so the movie opens with my fantasizing over what I wish it were, I guess. Uh -huh. Certainly fantasizing in that it's not what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the progression of the film is uh, my going to do my usual thing on this day, which is go to see Michael Caine, which is no... Um, um, how can I say, tough uh, Task. chore. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> He's wonderful. I, and then, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, I've heard that from many, many quarters, that he not only is a great actor, but everybody that works with him seems to really like him a lot. He's a fantastic actor and an even more beautiful person. Mm. He's, he's wonderful. And he really is a great reason why I took the picture, because I was afraid to go this erotic in a picture coming off Policewoman. And I felt, well, Michael Caine has such dignity, that'll be fine. <laughs> a, a, a little lust <laughs> and a little... balance me out. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, a little lust and a little dignity, a great combination, right? Yeah, yes. it's right. What about the lift so, scene in this movie? They talk about, the, they compare it uh, with uh, Hitchcock's shower scene from Psycho. Uh, well, it's bloody. Yeah. But it really, um, but Brian De Palma uh, takes, it takes from everything he loved, and he loved Hitchcock. But it really isn't a, the, the girl, or no one gets killed in a shower. Now, I say if you kill a girl in a shower, that's a deliberate steal. So it's influence, like singing a little like Sinatra, because he's so great. Yeah. But you're not Sinatra, you're somebody else. I understand. Well, we, we, we talked yeah. about... We talked about the taxi scene. Let's have a look at what we're talking about here, and then I want to hear the I want to hear the story of how you actually filmed this whole thing. Okay, is the, is right. the, in this scene, uh, um, Angie is in a in a museum, and um, she makes eyes at this gentleman, and eventually um, they get together at this taxi cab. Have a look at. Well, at this point, she thinks she's lost him. Here you are.
I shouldn't have been so rude. Thank you for picking up. Mm. That in there at the most important part. <laughs> what? When you shot this scene, I understand that you actually had to get almost undressed and do this real passionate scene right in the middle of a street in New York. Is that right? It was horrible. <laughs> uh, the um, that that that's the scene, the page where I broke up laughing when I read the script the first time. I thought it was impossible to do. So we did it all day long in New York City, and every sanitation truck and every bus <laughs> that passed by the taxi looked down that rear that uh, rear window and saw someone who looked an awful lot like Angie Dickinson <laughs> doing terrible things. <laughs> and it was so embarrassing. It was the toughest scene maybe I've ever had to do. How long did you say the whole shoot took? Of the taxi, yeah. all day long. Oh, really? All day. <laughs> <laughs> of course, people traveling, people traveling the public transport and the buses, of course, would have had the best view looking down. Uh... They certainly did. Yes. <laughs> and it... oh, oh, I remember, Don. Uh, once we, we came to a stop, and I, I think we just, uh, we were so scrunched up, we had to get out and stretch our legs. We'd, or there was traffic tie-up or something. And a bunch of kids got out of a van, and they also were higher. And they saw me get out of the cab, and they said, Yay, Pepper, right on. And they were so happy that I finally got laid. Oh, we'll be back with poor Angie Dickinson after this commercial break that she got. What? Thank you very much, and we're back, and we're talking to Angie Dickinson by satellite from Hollywood. Uh, Angie, getting away from the motion picture for just a while, uh, I recently read a quote by you that said, uh, I'd like to pretend I struggled for my career, but I didn't. You sort of fell into an acting career, as I, as I can gather. Excuse me, I just burped my oh, no. beer. Are you drinking, I, I, are you drinking beer I then? How, yes, I don't know how close this is, to, but yes, I love beer. Yes. <laughs> You should come down to Australia. They've got the best beer in the world down here, you see. That's another good reason to get there. Yeah. <laughs> Someday. How long have you been a beer drinker? Uh, since policewoman, really. Beer and popcorn, because I don't like heavy drinking, but boy, at 6 o'clock, for four years, it, uh, not every night, but yeah. occasionally it felt, it felt great. It was sort of unfashionable, though, in America for a while. I mean, for a lady to walk in and say, I want to have a beer or something. Yeah. So... So, yeah. I even put ice in it, so that's how unfashionable yeah. I am. <laughs> so I don't really care about that. Well, you oh. talked about policewoman. Let's talk about that. Uh, that was a pretty big challenge in those days to make uh, a, a realistic uh, look out of a woman actually holding a, a, a position in the police department with the respect uh, given to male members of the police department. Don, you're very astute, or somebody supplied you with an awful lot of good homework. I'm very flattered that you mentioned that, because last year, when I was, oh, it was when I was in New York doing Dress to Kill, mm. the police department of New York gave me a citation, uh, and it's a beautiful citation, how uh, their police women want to um, emulate, am I saying it backwards, but they want to be like I was, and it was so great, and the police commissioner and his whole staff presented me with this wonderful honor, and that's after it was already finished. Mm. But it was the first of its kind, and the only since. Uh -huh. There's not been another, there's not, actually, there's not been another dramatic um, female starring in a TV show in America, mm. uh, and a regular series. Uh, some have it's some have tried. Comedy. Some have tried, but, but they I mean, haven't. oh, I mean, I mean successfully. That's right. Yeah. 
yeah. and so it was a challenge but I think also Don the fact that it came when it did the fact that it was new and not too heavy into the woman's movement mm. just on the brink of it was a very big asset and helped me a lot let me talk about something else here which I've read about it says you've just completed Charlie Chan and the curse of the dragon queen Yes. Is that right? <laughs> and you are the dragon queen, is that it? Oh, and that's, yes, I certainly am. That is not G-G-I-N apostrophe. Oh, I That <laughs> is D-R-A-G-O-N. And uh, wh who is in this with you? Peter Ustinoff, Lee Grant, Roddy McDowell, Brian Keith, uh, Rachel Roberts. It is, I think, very funny. It started out, oh, Richard Hatch, it's, it's, it's read very funny, and if it comes out at all like it was intended, it's going to be very funny. Peter Ustinov plays Charlie Chan. Another, another one of the world's funniest men, Peter Ustinov. He's wonderful. Yeah. And I, I look very different. I wear long, dark hair, and I'm very bizarre through the whole thing. But I, I think it'll be all right. Did you ever imagine that at 49 that they would have called you the sex symbol of the 80s? Never thought about it, and I still don't think about it. And um, if you want to drop it there, that's just fine. <laughs> <laughs> what? Can I, no, can I, I mention, don't think about it. Can I, mention, I, I just don't think about it. I, 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 I've read a very funny article about you. Uh, there was a magazine out. I don't want to really publicize it because I don't like magazines. Like, there was a magazine out called Skin Flicks uh, that evidently had all of these off-cut pictures of, of actresses in various states of undress. And uh, you wanted to sue them and then changed your mind. Well, that's probably another thing you read yeah. that I read, too, that I, you know, they, they print things you never, ever, never dreamed of saying, much less said. Like the first thing you, you said, yes, I did fall into the career. But the Skin Flick magazine, uh, I knew that I had no shot at, at suing them if I had, first of all, why sue them? You know, I looked good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No. The point is, Don, you don't sue unless you intend to win. And there was nothing libelous. They took the film and they took the uh, negative. Uh, they just cut the film apart and, and made blow-ups of them and printed them. So uh, you can't sue them for that. Well, obviously it doesn't bother you um, uh, that you were able to show your body. Uh, it's, it, it, it's terrific, by the way. I'm not uh, <laughs> making any, any bad news about it. But... Um, in the, in the shower scene in this motion picture, I understand that they substituted someone else's body for yours. Yes, they did. Um, as a, I, I just want to make one point about the uh, magazine. I didn't sue them. However, if you'd have asked me, do I prefer it, be there, I definitely do not. Right. Yeah. But suing is one thing, and wishing you weren't in it is quite another. Uh -huh. um, Yes, they used a gorgeous body, as you saw, if you saw Dress to Kill, uh -huh. for the very close parts of her fantasy. Uh -huh. And I got to go home that day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just... Sorry. Yeah. And everybody wishes you to stay around. Angie, they're giving me all sorts of wind-up signs because we're going to lose the satellite. So I... Oh, oh, oh. I really have to call it to a close. We're going to send you a case of Australian beer just to give you a little more incentive to come down. I hope everybody goes out and sees the picture. It is a wonderful motion picture, and I thank you more than anything for uh, taking the time to come in and talk with us like this. It's beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, Angie Dickinson. Would you say thank you. Thank you. Very, very beautiful and a very, very cooperative lady. Uh, wonderful to be able to talk to her. Dress to Kill, by the way, the motion picture, uh, has been compared very favorably to a, a lot of Hitchcock things, which is a, a big compliment for a motion picture. It's currently showing in Melbourne and Sydney and Perth, and it'll be in other states shortly. You look for it if you want to go see a thriller. About 18 months ago, uh, Sydney school teacher Phil Latterly answered an ad for a dog for sale. Uh, the dog called Molly cost him $5. It's probably the best $5 he's ever spent. It turns out that Molly has a love of music, 
and has even become a recording artist with an impressive list of personal appearances. Molly's going to sing in a moment, but first, say hello to Phil Latterly and the lady herself, Molly. Here they are. Come on in. <laughs> Um, if I pet her, she won't snap at me or anything. Mm, nothing of the sort. No, I always ask first. Hello, Molly. Really nice to talk to you. That's a strange hand on you, but it's my. Uh, it must have been a pretty big find for you. You read an ad in a paper and a dog for sale and five dollars, and then it turns out that it has talent as well. How did you find out about the talent? Well, she. Uh, I used to take a. I still do regularly uh, walking on an afternoon, and uh, the first, you know, one of, after about a, a year, she uh, started to, you know, look forward to the four o'clock walk. Uh -huh. So she started to make little noises. Yeah. So I made little noises back. She made bigger noises. I made bigger noises. <laughs> and uh, suddenly, before I knew it, I had a fully fledged singing dog on my hands. Does uh, is she aware of what's going on? I mean, if she sees an audience, will she start to perform? Uh... Well, this afternoon, with the uh, doing the rehearsal with the band, yeah. uh, without me prompting her, she got amongst the uh, the. Uh, chorus over there and started to sing along. Did she sing with you guys? Did she? Fantastic. It probably sounded the best, too. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> a joke. It's only a joke. We're only joking. It, and um, uh, what about the recording? There was a recording I announced the other day. You said RSPCA or something. I heard you talk about it on a Mike Walsh show. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I've got a friend, Kimball Randall, my manager, and uh, he's suggested that uh, we use uh, his band, the Axel Capris, to, to do a record. And we went into Axel Studios and... Uh, put it down on one Sunday afternoon and uh, so after that we've distributed a bit and uh, now it's with uh, Musicland. Does she have an agent or a manager or anything? Uh? Yes, Mr. Kimball Rendell. Oh yes? Yes, yes. Mr. Oh. Kimball Rendell. Okay. Well look, I'll just leave you to it. There's nothing like... Uh, you're about to be on. Are you... A <laughs> <laughs> She'll yawn in a minute. She, her, uh, her eyes sort of go at half mast like she's getting ready or something. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> That's what usually happens to my audiences. This doesn't happen. Okay, I'll leave you to it, Phil, and, uh, and I'll mind my own business. And just let me see, because I'm really anxious to see this uh, again, actually. I saw you on the Wall Show. It was terrific. But, uh... Okay, how on Australia? Among the little chows. Australian Terriers, we want to hear you howl. Mitzi up in Brizzy, Susie down the gong. Woo! Lionel down in Waterloo, come sing along. Don't sit on your tucker box, keep us on the track. Woo! Help us to go forward, we're sick of going back. Way round your bluey. and dash hounds. Heads back, sing a song, don't end up in the town. Wolf if you've got eczema, lads if you've got fleas. Tree. And 
host he never calls. The Grand Prix champion for 1980, Alan Joe. Phil Adderley and the beautiful Molly. Say thank you. Will you? Thank you very much, and, uh, and uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, Alan Jones came from a racing family, uh, his father making a name for himself here in Australia in the 50s. He did, in fact, win the Australian Grand Prix. Uh, ten years ago, Alan Jones decided to leave Australia and seek fame and fortune in the most dangerous and the fastest sport of them all, international motor racing. This week, he came home a world champion. Alan's assault on a Grand Prix championship uh, overcame many setbacks over those years, including uh, running a boarding house, selling used cars, and sometimes existing on the occasional can of baked beans. Uh, the winning style, that is his, also had to contend with rounding up the financial backing to survive on the international racetrack, uh, with little or no help from his fellow countrymen, I might add, but he succeeded. And after serving his apprenticeship in the gasoline alleys of Europe and America, he now heads the multi-million dollar Frank Williams racing team backed by a group of Saudi Arabian oil men. Alan Jones has returned home with the same spirit and desire in an attempt to win the Australian Grand Prix to be held here next month. He is Australia's own world champion in a very, very tough and a very, very competitive game, and you will find him a delightful gentleman. Ladies and gentlemen, the world driver for 1980, welcome home, Alan Jones. Here. <laughs> Well, that should make you feel good, uh, coming back home and people realizing just what you have done and what you've accomplished and so forth. Must be a nice feeling. It's fabulous. I was, I, was, I was very worried following up that act. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of people can follow. They say, right. what do they say? Never follow a kid or an animal act. That's the rule That's of the business. Right. Alan, I if I just can, um, I'd like you to explain a couple of things. Uh, I know that there was a lot of things until I started this research on you. There's a lot of things about this that I really don't know. And I'm sure there's a lot of other people the same way. When you talk about Formula One racing, what does that mean, Formula One? It's, uh, it's the top echelon of international open wheeler racing. Uh, it, you have to build the car to comply to a strict formula, i.e. a certain width and length and weight and uh, engine capacity, which is 3 litres, 3,000 cc. Uh -huh. um, there's 16 races starting in Argentina and en ending up in America in 16 different countries. Yeah. And, uh, there's nine points for a win, six for second, four for third, three, two, one, down to six. Right. And it's the man with the most amount of points at the end of the year as the champion. This car, of course, is a, a replica of uh, your car, even down to the colors and the, uh, and the advertising on it. Yes, so yes, there. it's yeah. almost identical. Well, I just I call attention to that just so people can see the kind of vehicle that we're talking about. Uh, very, very specialized uh, uh, work on these things, isn't it? It is. Um, we have a lot of materials on the vehicle that uh, come directly from the aircraft industry. Uh, honeycomb construction, honeycomb aluminium, uh, a lot of exotic fiberglass materials and, and, and metal materials. Mm. We have our own wind tunnel at the factory. You know, we, the, the, we have an R&D department 
and we spend far more time actually testing and developing than what we do racing. Well, what about the quest for this, uh, this world championship? Uh, what prompted you, uh, what gave you the desire to go after this? Well, ever since I was knee-high to a grasshopper, I was, I was wrapped in motor racing because my father used to race and I used to go to the circuits with him and it was just a natural progression as far as I got, as soon as I got my license, I was going to go motor racing. Mm. And then I went to England as a tourist and, and to, had, to have a look around. And then when I came back to Australia, I decided that if, if I wanted to do it seriously and make a profession out of it, there was only one place to be and that was in England because that's where it all happens. Right. And what about when you're, when you're driving a car, Alan? You're in that car and um, you're doing it out there. Is it sort of a team effort? Is it the pit crew and you working together or are you uh, more or less on your own when you're driving that car? No, you, you're totally on your own. Once you hop into that cockpit, I don't even have to be on the track. I've just, once I'm in the cockpit, I'm by myself completely and my, mm -hmm. I, my whole, I just change. I just concentrate 100% on what I've got to do. How much of the tactics are worked out with the team itself? Uh, none, really. Uh, Frank Williams leaves it entirely up to me to work out what I should be doing and when I should be doing it. There is maybe one or two examples towards the end of this year, say, of Carlos Reutem and my teammate happened to be leading yeah. and I needed the points to win the championship. Well, then Frank would probably tell him to slow down and let me pass, but that's never happened. Right. And uh, if you don't mind my asking about this, now it's sort of a rough subject for me. I get the I don't like getting into heavy things like this, but uh, there is a great element of danger in this thing that you're doing. I just want people to have a look at what we're talking about. I want you to particularly look at a scene here, but I want you to watch it all the way through because the end result of this will probably astound you. I just want you to take a look at this here. This is... Uh Vierte Runde Flugplatz, Fabi immer noch vorn. Und dann Manfred Winkelhock. Dieser achtfache Überschlag wird wohl als einer der spektakulärsten Unfälle in die Geschichte des deutschen Motorsports eingehen. Manfred Winkelhock ist unverletzt. Nur ein paar schmutzige Kühe. Okay, well, now that's a pretty frightening sort of thing to see, but yet he walked away from that. Uh, yeah, he's had good practice, that guy. Has he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's had those before. Has yeah, he, he yeah. makes a bit of a habit of it, I think. Oh, yeah? yeah. What about yourself? Is the fear ever cut to you? Or do you ever think about that, the element of danger? Or? Well, I'd, I'd be a liar to say I never think about it. I do think about it, um, and I try and take all the precautions necessary. I try and make sure I wear all the proper protective clothing and that, mm. you know, I have all the proper gear. And I, I try and eliminate as much as I can, but there is always that element of doubt, of course, a mechanical failure or something, which is all the driver's biggest fear. Mm. But, uh, you know, it can happen, and I just hope it doesn't, because it's the best thing I know how to do, and I wouldn't be very good at anything else, so I've got to <laughs> yes. stick with what I know. What about the spectators there? Uh, I remember a few years back I saw an ad on television in the United States for the Indianapolis 500, for example, and they showed one wreck after another, you know, and they sort of, do you think the crowd, like you get 100,000 people out for one of these things, uh, are they there for the skill and the, and the, uh, the highly sophisticated uh, uh, engines and, and handling of cars, or do you think they're there because it's sort of like a, a bullfighting thing, a, a sort of love-hate relationship waiting for something to happen? Uh? I like to think that the majority of people are there to see a very fine motor car driven to its limit mm. correctly, you know, true enthusiasts. But I'm not naive enough to assume that they're, that they're all there for that. I know that there are a certain amount of people that go there because they want to see an accident. I, don't, I believe no one really wants to see anybody killed or hurt, but they, they'd like to see a good smash. A little excitement of something flipping yeah, like that thing yeah, that yeah, we saw. Yeah, yeah. I, mean that, yeah. I mean, I like <coughs> watching that. What about yourself with the concentration in a car? Is, you know, there's a threshold of pain with almost every sport. I mean, uh, does it get tedious? Or do, do you get tired? Or how hard is it to concentrate all the time? And well, it never gets tedious. Uh, it does get tiring. And I, I seem to run into a second wind. I, I get to a stage where I might be getting an ache in the back or feeling a little bit tired. And then all of a sudden I get into a second wind. It's like getting yeah. into a high. And then I can drive like that all day. Let me talk to you about the gear you wear. I saw a piece of film where you were putting things on. What do you have to, I saw about, was I right, two pairs of gloves and three sets of underwear and all sorts of things? Uh? Well, I wear two pairs of socks and I wear long, what looks like long johns and a polar neck uh, thing that goes with it, which is all Nomex flame proof. Right. Then above that, I wear a three-piece quilted overalls, just like a quilted uh, uh, bed, you know, a bedspread, yeah. uh, which weighs in itself about six, seven pounds. And I put that on and then I wear a balaclava and then I wear gloves up to here, 
and then a three-layer pair of fireproof shoes or boots. Is that hot in the... It gets warm, but funnily enough, you really get to a temperature and you maintain it. I, I, I seem to stay the, main temp the same temperature in the car, irrespective of whether it's 110 degrees or whether it's 70 degrees. You're a very superstitious person. Uh, yes. They tell me, now you can correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> they tell me that you will only race, and I'm not making a joke here, is it true? They tell me you will only race if you're wearing red underpants. Yes. Is that <laughs> But uh, some journalists have been confused and they've had me wearing the same pair since 1973. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite as bad as that. Yeah. But what I do is if, when they get to the stage they have to be changed, um, <laughs> <laughs> through wearing out, um, uh -huh. my wife usually cuts the piece off and then stitches it onto the new, the new one. So I've so got some sort of continuity mm. with my luck. But you are wearing patched underwear and... Uh, yeah, but it's all red. It's all red, yeah, yes. Right. yes. Oh, well, that's okay, as long as it is. What about your wife? You mentioned your wife, Beverly. Uh, how does she cope with all of this pressure? There must be a lot of pressure on you from time to time. Uh. Well, there is, because uh, I can deal with the pressures in my own way, and I can go off and do, do things to offset the pressure, whereas I think it's, for her it's a bit worse, because she just has to bear the blunt of my bad moods or snapping at her. And uh, she's pretty good. She knows when to stay away and when to come up and you know, when to do the right things. This Australian Grand Prix now, um, it's not um, a race that where they get points on the circuit. Uh, what is the reason for that? Uh, oh, it, it doesn't count towards the World Championship because Australia hasn't been allocated a World Championship event. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a lot of people working to, to correct that. And uh, I, I honestly believe and hope that Australia will have a World Championship round by 1983. It would be nice to have that included in a circuit, especially. Oh, it'd be fabulous. It'd be great. You have remained, and I don't mean to be waving a flag, but you have remained, uh, in spite of a lot of things, which we won't go into because everybody's talked about it, but you have remained fiercely Australian. You advertise that you're Australian. Uh, oh, uh, yes. I'm proud to be an Australian. I yeah. love it. Do you feel you represent Australia when you're driving as well? Yes, I wear an Australian uh, flag on my overalls and tell everybody I'm an Australian, and, mm. you know, I think I do my bit. Yeah, I think you do, too, very well. So can I have, where's that... Uh, but can I let you? We have one of these. Your son is, what's his name, Christian? Uh, Christian, yeah. Christian. We thought it'd be a good idea. This is the kit from this thing here that makes it up. The, they run a lot. These cars really go fast, too. Yeah, <laughs> they're the really quick. Okay, we thought we'd give you that, okay? Oh, Just for much. him as a present from us. Uh, you know, it's a, a little something. It's a little personal. We figure if he's running around and he's playing with it, at least a, it's a touch from us. Uh, this uh, Australian Grand Prix is when? Uh, November 16th. November the 16th. Yes. Okay. Well, I hope you do well in it, and I thank you for coming in and joining us. And the eyes of Australia are upon you now. You've proved your point, I think. Okay, thanks okay, for having Okay, we want to thanks to the uh, Tim Meyer distributors for the use of the model car. Alan Jones and other internationals against Australia's best at the Calder Raceway, 15th and 16th. There's still some limited grandstand seats available from Bob Jane Team Arts, or you can see uh, Coast to Coast on the Nine Network, where we'll be doing it as well, okay? How about a hand for a true champion, Alan Jones? Well, thank you. <laughs> I've concentrated on that for the whole night. Right. We'll be back. We've got the Peter Warland and... Uh, the Debbie High School Band, you'll enjoy yourself. Fever is in the air, and next Tuesday, one of the most famous annual race meetings in the world will be staged right here in Melbourne, the Melbourne Cup. And it is in this area, at the Total Azeda Agency Board telephone betting room, that more than 110,000 calls are expected to come in. Now, we're going to take you behind the scenes where you will see how your bet is placed into the computers, that whole intricate system we're going to explain to you. Also on the show, live in the studio, the newly crowned Miss Universe, the beautiful Sean Weatherly, who also happens to be the current Miss USA. And on next Thursday night's show, this man, a star of Blue Lagoon, Christopher Atkins. Now, this 19-year-old newcomer has become an overnight heartthrob and stars alongside teenage superstar Brooke Shields in this motion picture. He is uh, absolutely just sent uh, all the people in a rage uh, in, the, in the film world. And uh, we will have him here. He will be live to talk about the film. We'll probably see a clip from the film as well. Anyway, that's all next Thursday night. So I hope you'll be joining us for that. The Debney Park High School Band is unique for one very special reason. The school is regarded as a disadvantaged school.
with grounds consisting of three quarters of an acre of concrete, a small patch of grass, one three-story building, and an old red brick building that was the first women's jail in Melbourne. And in addition, the school population not only come from predominantly non-English speaking backgrounds, but many come from underprivileged ones. The band consists of 40 members whose ages range from 12 to 17, and to see the Debney Park Band is to see the faces of 17 different cultural backgrounds. Here to tell us more before we listen to them is the band manager, Peter Warland. Would you welcome, please, Peter Warland. Here. Well, this sounds like quite a group of, uh, of kids here. Now, how did all of this start, uh, Peter? It all started, Don, in uh, 1975, towards the end of 1975-76. John Howie, the music teacher at the school then, put in for a grant, which was a, a new grant in the federal government mm -hmm. for disadvantaged schools in the supplementary grants program, and got approximately $5,000, and the whole program started from there. It's now worth, uh, the instruments alone are worth over 20000 Some of them are... Bit, uh, We've begged for them. Yes, some of them are borrowed, and some of them are borrowed for so long they're just about stolen. But uh, <laughs> we've got the instruments now, and we're underway. Well, I was talking about the nationalities, these kids, and the cultural backgrounds. It's a great conglomerate here, isn't it? Uh... Yeah. At our school, we've got 33 different nationalities, and mm. I think uh, the band's just been updated. We've got about 20 different nationalities now with mm. the uh, Vietnamese intake that we've had of late. Yeah. And other low-income uh, homes, uh, underprivileged kids as well? Uh... Yes, the school's made up of a, a fairly good mix. Uh, there's quite a few from the high-rise flats, a little over a third. Um, but there's also some others from various other places. There's, there's a fair mix, but generally, inner suburban Melbourne's a fairly tough neighbourhood, and I'm not making any excuses for, uh, for the uh, economic viability of the families. We have a lot of problems raising money, a lot of problems. Well, how do you raise the money? Uh? Well, uh, that's my job. Our conductor's Les Fagan, he does a great job with the music, but it's my job to try and get the money together. Supplementary grants program's worth, um, well, it's worth a couple of thousand a year, and we couldn't do without it for repairs of instruments and so on, but to take them around Australia like we've just done, outback New South Wales and Queensland, that was worth about $20,000. And I had to you raise... You mean you made 20 or it cost you 20 The trip was worth 20 oh. and I had to somehow get that money or... Uh, the worth of it together in the last eight months. I see. Yeah. Which I've done by contacting various private companies uh, and municipal councils, uh, Apex clubs, Lions clubs, Rotary clubs, and so on. Well, you must be really proud of them because I watched them this afternoon, and boy, they put everything into it, yeah, and, yeah. and they are really good. Uh, that's the that's the other part. Yeah, they of work it, hard. Yeah. Uh, ten uh, before we went around Australia, it was ten hours a week. And they know that uh, if they're going to get anywhere in this world, they only do it by damned hard work. Now, it doesn't cost them anything. Uh, I raise all the money, and they do all the work, mm. and uh, they get the rewards. <laughs> yeah. sounds, like, sounds like a good arrangement to be. It sounds like you're getting a few rewards out of it as well, I'll tell you. What. Well, it's, it's very rewarding to see kids uh, strive and to see them succeed. Yeah. All right, what's this number they're going to do for us now? Uh, Crunchy Granola Sweet, uh, conducted by uh, Mr. Les Fagan and arranged by him as well. Okay, here they are, the Debney Park High School Band. Say hello to them.
go there. Here, yeah, come on. Come on. That's good. Come on, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. You even got a hand from our boys over there. I tell you what, when you get those guys to clap, you're doing all right. You know? <laughs> thank you, kids. You were terrific. Uh, Liz, thank you. Great job. You're, is he a slave driver? Is he this one? Yes? <laughs> He's definitely. Manny, come here. Just want to talk to you. I want you to meet. This is just one of the uh, young ladies in here that plays him in. We picked the tallest one. <laughs> she came in. This is Manny. And uh, I want to tell you about a concert. They got a benefit concert at the Richmond Town Hall on the 9th of November at 2.30 p.m. And benefit, of course, is for you. Uh, is that right? No, no it's not. not Who's the benefit? Who is the benefit for? Uh, the benefit is for one of our lads who's undergone some misfortune lately in losing both his mother and his father. Oh, well, all right. Well, then it's well worthwhile. It's at the Richmond Town Hall, 9th of November, is that what we said? That's right. And I hope you'll go out there and you'll go out and you'll see them and, uh, and enjoy yourself. We got a little prezzy for you here, okay? You were telling us about how difficult it was to get things going, so we thought perhaps maybe we'd uh, oh, give you that trombone, okay? It's a king, you know, one of the biggies, all right? Do you accept that for you? for all these kids, they're terrific. And what they're doing is just great. And these two men, too, for working on it. We'll be back with the wheel in a minute. Hang in there, don't you go away. You stand over here. On Don's Wheel, tonight you can win this exciting new Toyota Corolla CS manual sedan, valued at around $6,430 on the road. Your new Toyota comes to you with the compliments of Pit Stop Motors, of South Yaris and Kilder and Elstonwick, one of Australia's leading Toyota dealers, and Pit Stop Motors want your business. And the matchless FAF electronic sewing machine with more inbuilt features than any other in the world. Plus the incredible time-saving FAF rotary ironer, total value $1,825. And the TAA Great Keppel Island Holiday for two. You'll have one week to enjoy relaxing on this Great Barrier Reef Wonderland and to fly there and back with TAA the friendly way. And this magnificent Kimball home piano valued at $1,895. Kimball is available from Paul Hayward Organs of High Point, Dandenong and now at Mount Gravatt, Brisbane. Gang. Hi there. It, Don, Hi there, Bertram. I have got some magnificent news, and this just proves once again that if you want to get to the heart of a real performer, get to the heart of a musician. Right. This yeah. is a serious announcement. For the kids from Debney, which you've just seen on camera, eight members of the band, the Graham Lyle Band, have agreed to play as a curtain raiser, as it were, to their act at that special concert. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Thing is, it was to have been the Daddy Wilson Big Band. <laughs> now being cancelled, and we had no, but no, eight no, of the boys. No. Eight of the boys. Well, we won't ask which eight because we don't want to embarrass the ones that don't want to show up. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, which eight? Which eight are they? Uh, let's hear the, the eight, eight that's gone. Uh, the eight, uh... Keith Johnson, he'd do, he'd do it, wouldn't he? You yeah. do your Keith? Yeah. You low animal. What's <laughs> <laughs> you doing, Keith? No, You're so worth a million, not... too, you old bugger. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, you are doing it for the kids. Poor little Londoner, it used to be one yourself. No, 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 never. We were neighbours as kids. He was never a kid. Yes, was he, was yes, he a good... He was, I yes. bet he was fat with little shorts on. Yeah. Was he? Yeah, I bet. He, the, yeah. he was the only kid we knew in North Fitzroy who, who really enjoyed the sex. Did we, he? Yes, he practised he practiced morning and night. Yeah. Didn't you, eh? Go on, you kids. S-A-X, Sax. S-A-X. Right. Right. Did he okay. have zits? Which eight? Please stand up the eight who volunteered. No, don't leave them. No, you'll embarrass the Go guys. on. Don't. No. Okay, right. Oh, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll be all right. Anyway, thank you, boys. Whoever's yeah. going to go over there, that's Very great. Nice. The kids will really enjoy all of that. Yeah, it'll be terrific. Have you been? I haven't seen you all night. Oh, I feel pretty talking. good. Lovely seeing uh, Alan Jones. Yes. You, you know something? Well, I go back a long way, not with Alan, but with his dad, late Stan Jones. Stan Jones, who was a great racing driver himself, as you mentioned, he was one of the first men on radio to do car valuations, you know, for, uh, for his own car firm. You'd ring up and ask what a, you know, 
oh, a 51 holes and so forth. Yeah, right. And he was, for those people who remember Stan Jones, not only was he a fine car racing driver, <laughs> but he was a real piece of Hollywood. Yeah. He, oh, good looking man, uh, real sort of hunky type. Macho. Macho, yeah, right, long before yeah. Macho was even in power. Yeah, right. Sort of uh, your image, Macho. Yeah. Which eight of you are actually going to No, no, please? it's all right, don't. <laughs> would you like to be now? Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you'd like me to go along, I'd do a couple of numbers with her, a all couple right. of songs. Did... Why don't you go? Now, that wouldn't do you any harm to do something for nothing. Go on. <laughs> Yeah, what day, what, day, what day is November the 9th? It's a Sunday. Oh, what a pity. I'm going to match. Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you is what. Is that Sunday week? Yeah. Sunday Where week. is it? At the Richmond Town Hall? What time? I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> right. So there you go. There you go. Right. Are you really going on November the 9th? Yes. Isn't that terrific? Well, I can speak up for Mike Walsh, too. Mike will be there. <laughs> <laughs> Who else would you like? Uh, Kerry Bedell, any singer. I'll go over there. What are you going to do? I don't know. I'll show up. I'll stand there. These, oh, if it's going to it's gonna be a kid's concert. So what? Well, can you imagine yourself walking out? I'm the good <laughs> shit. <laughs> what are you going to play on the good shit? They play Crunchy Girl. Did you hear that drummer? He's 13 years old and he plays better than him. <laughs> That's why he's going to get a few lessons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, are you ready, guy? Yes. What time is the concert on? 2.30 in the afternoon. 2.30 in the afternoon? Yes. Will you be okay on a Sunday afternoon, 2.30? Oh, just about. <laughs> okay. Well, if you're <laughs> going to... I would have been up for at least five minutes. Then. If you're going to be there, I'm going to be there. Yes? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, You're going to be there? You got to be there? You promise? Yeah. Okay. I promise I'll be there. Okay. You're not going to bring a whole entourage. You're coming by yourself. I'll you? bring the whole family, make up the audience. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Our first contestant is Mrs. Mavis Hill of Olympic Street in Horsham. Hello, Hello Mavis. Hill. How are you? Good to see you. I love it. How are you doing? Mavis is very frightening. Thank you. We don't have to. Come on over here. Mavis, uh, we, don't, we don't really want you to be frightened, Mavis. But, uh... <laughs> Mavis, could I ask you a question? Yes. What are you doing on the 9th of November? <laughs> Mavis is going to be there too, half past ten. <laughs> Mavis, Mavis will definitely be there, don't you yes. worry about it. Should be a great concert. How's everything, Mavis? You feeling all right? Yeah? It's sort of nice to see Mavis, you know, coming out of the industry. Of course it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there, there you are, you're on camera now. You're a Leo like me. Right. Yes. Oh, that's right. What's your, what, what does it say? There's a lovely trip over water which will incorporate business with pleasure. Oh, you're going to take a trip over <laughs> devil. <laughs> Actually, there's going to be a lot of money around you. Mrs. Hill should get a lottery ticket with Bert or any other Leo. Oh. Right? Would you like to get a lottery ticket with me? Yes, I wouldn't mind. Would you have a dollar on you could lend me? <laughs> Until Sunday week? You already got me into November 9th. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Fair enough. Fair okay, enough. you should... Or a Sagittarius or an Aries man. You should buy a ticket with one of these people. A new car, perhaps a company car for someone in the family. You got a car? Yes. Right. You do. Uh, a lovely bright aspect is an unexpected reunion or celebration. Is there someone you haven't seen for years that you'd like to see again? Oh, yes, any man. <laughs> yeah, well, just name one. Well, oh, it, it could be happening for you. You're not, you, you didn't come up here to think. Just try your nah, luck. Yeah. No. What number do you want, love? Can you, can you sort of turn around that way so you can see who you are? Yeah. What, okay. number? what number do you want? The, oh, 13. 13. Number 13. Okay, right. And, and on Leo. Leo. Hang on a sec. Just hang on. We have a car presentation tonight, too, you know. Goody, goody. Yeah. So, fellow, fellow back there to present the car. See, it won't go in. Huh? It won't, uh, hang on a sec. Oh, this is a... Max invented this. Yeah. <laughs> Go? No, I see it won't go. Wait, hang on. Wait a minute. Wait, I'll tell you. Let me see. Yeah. There we go. No, it's no. not, you see. No, it's not. Uh, All right, well, what the heck? It's on yeah, what there. The, it, it started on It's on there. If it starts yeah. on 13, you get a bonus prize. You know what I mean? Go over there and give it a big spin, Mavis. And no, no, good luck. We hope you win no. the car or something really nice. All right? Here we go. Yes, yeah. this is lovely. This is beautiful. From Danish Deluxe, the delightful Reckler Larn Suite. Uh, recovered in the natural look and feel of a real leather from Howe and Company. The value is $1,800.
Danish Deluxe in leather is a delight to own and features reclining action chairs with backs which you can set to your favourite position. I've and just got a new land suite. Have you? <laughs> well, gosh, you're going to have a lot of places for people to sit now because you've just got a new one. <laughs> but this is lovely. Actually, yeah. if you want, I mean, really, if you wanted to, you could sell yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps you've got somebody in your family or something yeah. who's just starting out. And or perhaps the people from there might... Uh, yeah. No? Well, it's mm, debatable. No, it's okay. debatable. Yes. We could go in and you have a go in and have a talk with them and tell All them right. that this is how much. Bert's going to give you a Don Lane oh, pin. Okay. Careful, don't move because you could lose your neck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, which medical instrument is used to listen to the movement of the heart? Stethoscope. Stethoscope is right. Okay, enjoy the prize. And thank you very much. Well, that, that was I need you by Don Lane. Uh, also tonight on Don's Wheel, you have the chance of winning these fabulous prizes. You could win from <laughs> Theodore Fine Jewelry, an exquisite diamond pendant of the value of $1,000 from Theodore Fine Jewelry, and for the most beautiful jewelry in Melbourne. <laughs> and also enough pure new wool carpet, the value is around $1,500 for a 12-square home from Dowson Carpets. <laughs> this Bondworth carpet comes to you from Dowson's four showrooms or shop at home service. Also, this modern-made fully automatic wall oven and the modern made and sealers and smells and there are four burner hot plates. <laughs> I don't what know. Page Featuring wrote. You know, I think my eyes are going on me for some reason or other, Don. I don't know. In the last couple of. In the, la in the last couple of. <laughs> <laughs> the value is around. I have trouble hearing sometimes, I've got to say. Pardon? What? How long has this been going on? Oh, what the hell? And also, there's a $1,000 wardrobe from Anthony Squires to Anthony the discriminating Chris. man. That's Anthony right. Squires' clothes are a way of life with style inherited only after 100 years of West End tailoring tradition. I mean, Don is wearing Anthony Squires. I'm wearing Anthony Squires. Uh, Graham Lyle, you're wearing Anthony Squires, aren't you? I think that suit looks like it's got Anthony Squires in it with him. It, it, <laughs> it looks very lovely. Yes. We'll take this break and then we come back. We certainly will. With That's right. We have a car presentation second... and everything. Yeah. Right? Whatever. We'll be back. Don't let that deter you. Thank you. Who we got on the I've got even better news for you, Don, and this is serious. What's up? Next uh, Sunday week, at, it's at the Richmond Town Hall, isn't it? At the Richmond Town Hall, we now have the entire Graham Lyle Orchestra, which is going to be there next <laughs> Sunday. So that, that really is uh, terrific. This is the, the first charity job a musician has done since Federation. <laughs> uh, it really is. It's, and I'd like to know what they've got in it for themselves. Oh, uh, no, 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 it's rather, it's a magnificent Listen, this gesture. is your chance, kid. A big band, get yes. out your best song and do a number. Don't you think I'm going to? What are you going to do? Oh, do something from the act. <laughs> from whose act? From anyone's act. Our second contest. They said, well, we've got to be off by 11 o'clock. If we're not off by 11 o'clock, firstly, they're going to cut the sound. Right. And then they're going to freeze us. Right. <laughs> I've got Dulcy Evans, who's a Piskies, of, Pisces, a Pisces of Cavendish Road in West, in West Moona, in Tasmania. Oh, you would say Piskies. Moona. Dulcy? That's right, Don. How, how are you? How are you? Yeah, yeah, Dulcy? Yes, Don. I, is this Dulcy? That's right. This is Don. How are you, Don? Okay, Dulcy, how are you? Oh, pretty nervous. Oh, you don't have to be... Dulcy? Hey. Is this Dulcy? Dulcie, yes. Dulcie. Yes. Is this Dulcie? Yes, that's me. Just a minute, Dulcie. Hello, Don. <laughs> that's you, Dulcie. That's me. Here's Don. <laughs> what number do you want to start on, Dulcie? We want to try and get you the car right away. Ask, ask Bert to pick me one, will you? Ask Bert to pick you one. Sure. Ooh. Um, ask Bert to pick me one. OK. Uh, number, it's coming to me, number. Just a minute, he's, he's, he's thinking. Hold on, hang on a sec. You mind if I draw it? No. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, no, uh, 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 it's either nine or six. N I'll go for nine. Nine? He's Ladies gonna start Pisces, well, hang on a sec. Nine. Yeah, wait, I got it. There we go. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's much better. Number nine. <laughs> right. <laughs> Number nine, he said you want it. Good luck, yeah. Dulcie. Here we go.
You've won some very fine watches. Have I? Yes. Lovely. Just a minute, Bert will tell you about it. It's a, it's a $1,000 showcase of superb citizen watches for ladies and gents from the range available at Proud's Australia's national jeweler, Dulce. Oh, beautiful. How's that, Dulce? $1,000 worth of watches. Oh, lovely. Isn't that good? Just answer this question. Oh, it's an easy one, Don. An easy what? Question. Oh, yes, okay, just a minute. Complete the following saying. You can lead a horse to water. But you can't make him drink. That's right, and if you get a bad play for nothing, you're in good shape. If you'd like to be on Don Post Office Box 333, Richmond, Victoria, 3121. Just finally, Graham, does that include the girls uh, on Sunday week? Oh, that's mad. So there'll be a raffle. There'll also be a raffle on... Uh, on, <laughs> on this is this one of your famous <laughs> chook raffles, isn't it? Yes. Right, right. I'll tell you what, I'll buy a couple of tickets. Oh. So around we go. It's not easy to spin this anymore. It should be a magnificent afternoon. OK. But I have, to, I have to go over now. After I pick this out, I gotta, we have to go over and... Uh, and uh, is there a car presentation, is there? Yes. Ken, Ken Morgan's going to present the car. <laughs> That's right. Sorry. Ken, Ken's over there to present the car, and we'll, we'll, we'll be with him in just a minute. I've got Lucy One Shock. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Lucy One Shock yeah. sang out. The... But was it a beauty? And she's, she's from, from Furnacedale. Furnacedale in Western Australia. And oh, I was at the Furnacedale one shocks. I've got Billy Kincaid. Hey, oh, Billy Kincaid. Hey, oh, Billy of yes. Dennis Street in, uh, in Hyde. Okay, thank well, you Well, this is much. your moment. Yes. This is your chance to try out a brand new act. What's that? You are now working to set a stage to work with the king of them all. Well, would you say hello to Ken Morgan? Yes. Please? He's going to present the car. Okay. Here's well, yeah. Ken. Very nice um, would you say hello to Alsa Thornton from Bonignang over here? Say hello, Alsa. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Ken, this is what number car is this now? Uh, number 63. Car number 63 that he's given out. 12 this year. 63 since you've been associated with us. That's great. Well, you can do your presentation to Alsa and talk about the car or whatever sales you got or whatever's going on. Everything's going on. How about that? Five and a half years and I've now got my own theme song. <laughs> yes, you do. You now have it. Shaking all over. Yes. I give up. <laughs> wonder how they picked that out. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> uh, right. Yes. Okay. Okay. All speech to me. Uh, Elsa, on behalf of Hitstop Motors. Ken, like Ken's Hitstop. the master of the pause. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 30 second delay. Uh, Elsa, on behalf of Pitstop Motors, you're new to add a Corolla, which is the number one selling car in the world today. And of course, Pitstop Motors being the number one dealer as we are in Australia, and very proud of it. Love your modesty. Thank you very much. Right. We're proud of it. Why be modest when you're proud well, of it? Absolutely right. If you, I mean, if you got it, flaunt it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> winch, winch. Say no more. Elsa, on behalf of Pitstop Motors, good luck, good motoring, and thanks, Don, for all your help. It's oh, great. pleasure. Would you have anything to say, Elsa? We'll see you again Monday night. Would yes, you? I've got a speech to the nation. You have a speech to the nation? Yes. Oh, this could be a while. Go ahead, Elsa. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank um, you, Ken Morgan, for making this wonderful car available on the Don Lane wheel. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of pleasure out of it. Mm -hmm. And if I can do my grandmotherly thing now... Oh, sure. Right. You're a grandmother. Go ahead. <laughs> if you're a grandmother, you, you earned it. I did. Right. Um, if I could say um, a big cheerio to Linda, Simon and Paul in Ballarat and in New Guinea um, because this is being taped to... Uh, to um, I didn't even Loretta. know we went to New Guinea. Do we no, go to New Guinea? No. <laughs> Loretta. I'll send a message for you. You want a message to New Guinea? Just yes. a minute. We're send a message to New Guinea there. To Loretta and Savonette and Lyle, Diane and Gregory up there, we're looking forward to seeing you in February. Can I say something I found out yesterday? This lady is one of the foremost social workers in this country. Is that oh, a no. lovely lady? Mm. Oh, yes, you are. We thank know all about it. And thank Pit Stop Motors and Alsa. Have a lovely time. We'll be back. We've got to give away one of them. Okay? okay. You make it so easy, you make it so free, I never thought that I'd feel so good inside and still feel me. Can we leave you with a definition 
of a parking space. A parking space is an area that disappears when you make a U-turn. <laughs> I'll see you. I love your faces. Take it easy.